prior to, uh, say, the First World War, um, actually all the way up into Korea, uh, but there were four original all-black uh, regular army regiments. There were two infantry regiments, the 24th and 25th infantry, and uh, two cavalry regiments, the 9th and 10th. And those had been in existence as segregated black, all black units uh, since the, after the Civil War. And they, they remained in existence in one form or another uh, up until Korea. So the second division itself was uh, an all white division um, throughout the First World War, Second World War. When the second division following World War II came to Fort Lewis um, around 1948-49, it, uh, uh, one of its regiments was the 9th Infantry Regiment. Um, its first two battalions, 1-9 and 2-9, were both all-white regiments. However, its third battalion, uh, the 3rd Battalion, 9th Infantry Regiment, was uh, one of two all-black battalions that were assigned to the 2nd Division at this time. And that was the first time that the 2nd Division had had segregated units uh, assigned to it. Uh, but in this case, they were still segregated, but it was the 503rd Artillery Battalion, um, of which uh, the late Representative Charlie Rangel, who was one of the longest serving members of uh, the House of Representatives from uh, New York, I believe, um, he had been uh, a young uh, officer in uh, the 503rd Artillery Regiment as part of the 2nd Division and fought with them in Korea. The, uh, the 2nd Division had three, three infantry regiments, three battalions each, Eight of those uh, regiments were all white, but the 3rd Battalion, 9th Infantry Regiment was an all black battalion. Uh, and in fact, there's that famous photo of the 3rd Battalion on parade uh, right along Watkins Field uh, going through the regimental area just before their deployment to Korea in 1950. It's interesting because it was adventurous, the whole idea that they would be leaving Harlem and New York and not knowing where they were going, and the recruiting non-commissioned officer was very, very, very good because he convinced me that this year would be the best thing for me. But when he started talking about the villages send the checks home, all I could think of was that smile on my mother's face when she got that check from my older brother. And uh, before I knew it, I was shipped off to Fort Dix with hundreds, hundreds of 18-year-old and at that time, the prefix to our serial number was U.S. And even today, you can distinguish between a regular army uh, person with the R.A. as opposed to someone that was drafted. I confused them all because the draftee was U.S. 57. But I was only in the army four months before I decided I was going to become regular army and enlist for three years. And so I, the U.S. became R.A., but the 5-7 stayed. And so people were ugly confused that I was part drafted and part regular, but I was discharged regular army. Now, what happens to, for, for practical purposes to end segregation within the military? We'll go back to 1948 where President Harry Truman had been lobbied by various groups to, to, to end segregation. There had been attempts to end segregation in, in, in the military that had failed, met a lot of resistance, uh, more often than not from those in uniform, the senior leaders. Um, and it was one incident in particular that really struck Truman. Um, and it was a, a, a soldier, uh, an NCO, recently returned from uh, service overseas, a uh, decorated combat veteran um, who was dragged off a bus and, and beaten in, uh, in South Carolina uh, in uniform within an inch of his life. In fact, he lost, uh, I believe, at least sight in one eye because of the beating. And that got quite a bit of press, and, and it really struck Truman Hart, who himself had been a segregationist and in support of the segregated military. But he said, no. This is someone who fought for their country. There's no reason. And uh, couldn't get legislation passed through Congress, so he did it by executive order. Another gentleman of note, and I'm going to bring this out, is uh, Julius Becton. 
Um, Julius Becton uh, was also a World War II veteran. Um, he had been a, a, a junior officer um, at the very end of the Second World War, served in the Philippines. He was at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and the commanding general read the proclamation and then put it down and said, but this will never happen as long as I'm in charge. While I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground, when the order was issued, the commander of the post called all the officers together. He read the executive order signed by the president. And after he finished, and Aberdeen by was a completely integrated post, read the executive order. He called the, to the officer and he said, as long as I'm here, there'll be no change. And by that he meant officer club number one, officer club number two, swimming pool number one, swimming pool number two, NCO club number one, NCO club number two. All the ones are white, all the twos are black. And during his period as the commander, after the order was issued, no change. Forget about it. I know. We wish we could have laughed about it because even raising it, uh, people ignored it. And the history of the darn thing, even when I left the Army in 1952, there was segregation. A lot of people think that the executive order uh, went into effect in 1948, and it may have, but it sure didn't in the 2nd Infantry Division. Korea came on so fast. Uh, when North Korea invaded South Korea in the summer of 1950, the 2nd Division here at Fort Lewis was uh, immediately put on alert for a, a deployment to Korea. And uh, in fact, they were the first division to arrive uh, from the States in Korea. And the 9th Infantry Regiment was the first infantry regiment to land on Korean soil from the 2nd Division uh, and to go into combat. However, the 3rd Battalion was actually held back. Um, and I've read different accounts of why some of them are legitimate. They needed them over here to secure a part of the, the perimeter that the UN forces had formed around the port of Pusan, um, while the other two battalions of the regiment went forward into the line and into combat. Eventually, the 3rd Battalion is moved into combat and is involved in all of the division's uh, major fights um, for the remainder of the war. We arrived into Pohang, which was in the Pusan perimeter, the southern tip of Korea latter part of the third, fourth week, uh, July 19 and 50. Because we were arriving with part of the division, our battalion was pulled out of the regiment and sent on a separate detail, which none of us could understand why. I later found out what the story was. The, the folks in MacArthur headquarters weren't too sure about the effectiveness of this black battalion. And they wanted to put us out to a place where we could be tested. Uh, by providing airfield security and fuel of things. Uh, we went on that mission, did well. The regiment caught hell. They took heavy fire. We were pulled back into the regiment, put into the line, and we were there when the efforts were to push out of the Pusan perimeter to take the offensive, and that was in September when we moved out September 1950 uh, into actually engage in combat as part of the regiment. Uh, again, the 503rd uh, Artillery Battalion is an all-black battalion firing in support of the 2nd Division. The 3rd Battalion, 9th Regiment, segregated all-black infantry battalion uh, fighting along with the division. What happens is the fighting is so fierce throughout the remainder of 1950 and into early 1951 that casualties, combat casualties, non-combat casualties, just turnover uh, starts to really have an impact on uh, just manning the frontline infantry battalions. Also the Army starts to institute the individual replacement program. That's where a unit stays in combat and just individuals rotate in and out. What happens as they tried to keep units segregated because there's so many more white units than black units, what happens is the uh, number of black replacements disproportionately starts to outnumber the number of white replacements by proportion. What happened is commanders 
um, and the 9th Infantry Regimental Commander uh, at the time just said, I don't care. You didn't care what the color of the guy next to you was. Um, he was a soldier. Um, that's really what mattered. The 3rd Battalion, uh, all of the prejudices that had existed uh, against uh, blacks, uh, black soldiers' ability to fight, I mean, the 3rd Battalion disproved all of that. For practical purposes, that's how the Army integrated um, during the Korean War. A gentleman um, by the name of Rutherford Bryce uh, was a young officer, and there are photographs of him clearly giving orders to white platoon leaders. And the accounts that I've read from, from the black soldier's perspective was when they went into the front lines, again, no, nobody cared. Uh, it, it became an, a non-issue. I was Special Forces, Forces Insurgents as, as a jumper. And we had an advance drop, 66% casualty. I was hit in my leg and was sent to the Philippines, to Manila. And it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a serious kind of thing. It was like sh more shrapnel than anything and just scraped up my bone a little bit. At any rate, um, I came out of that and I couldn't jump. So I was sent to the 2nd Infantry Division. That's when I went to the 2nd, uh, was the 23rd Infantry Regiment, C Company of the, of the 2nd Infantry Division. And, and where the, the uh, 187th had gone, I joined that same, so I went to the, basically the same place because the marshalling area and the reserve training area for the second infantry division was just where the other one had left, if that made any sense to you, where, where I was with the 187. They went off to, I don't have a clue where. If we go back, you keep having these experiences of there's, there was a prejudice against um, black soldiers you know, being able to fight, that they couldn't fight, when they kept proving time and time again that they could. Um, the First World War, we had two um, all-black divisions. Uh, one served under the French. Uh, was actually given French weapons, French equipment, French helmets, U.S. uniforms, and they performed extraordinarily because the French didn't care what their color was. There was a 761st Tank Battalion, which was an all-black tank battalion, which Patton said was the best independent tank battalion he'd ever seen. Um, they were called the Black Panthers, had a cool logo on their tank and everything. So 369th, my unit in World War II, had fought with the French because they preferred, they wanted us, and it will. Came back well rewarded. Um, and when the 369th got back in the States, they were not greeted as heroes, but they came back from New York and jeered. In 1925, I could be off by a year, there was a study done at Carlisle Barracks, the Army War College, basically saying that the black soldiers, while they may be good doing stevedore work, laboring, they were not good for thinking through a project or being able to officially control soldiers and could not do certain other things, technical things. That study stayed around for a long time. So when World War II came along, that was the mentality of the officer corps, of the leadership, of the War Department. No reason to change it. When B.O. Davis became a fighter pilot, he had some major problems, but because the 93rd, the um, 99th Pursuit Squadron did very well. We were able to shoot down aircraft and not lost an aircraft, not lost a fighter that they were escorting, or a bomber that they were escorting. So it doesn't surprise me or anyone else that some, there are certain beliefs in the military leaders that, oh, just a president, that we can do, what this is our army, and we're going to do what we want to do. May I point out today, in 2000 and 15, you have attitudes where folks are saying one thing and the president saying something else. It's not much different. The 24th Regiment, at, which in Korea had been part of the 25th Division, 
it had seen some of the worst fighting during the early part of Korea. It had gotten a bad reputation, quite unfounded. Certainly no worse than any other of the white regiments, and particularly considering the unique circumstances under which it was operating, segregation. And the regiment was disbanded in 1951. Back in 1995, uh, I was a, a platoon leader. I was a rifle platoon leader here on, Fort Lu on what was then Fort Lewis. Uh, I was in the 3rd Battalion, 9th Infantry Regiment. Uh, we were the Manchus, very proud. I mean, a lot of esprit de corps. Only regiment in the uh, Army uh, that was authorized its own belt buckle with, with a regimental uh, crest on it. Uh, of course, you had to do it, what they called the Manchu Mile or, or Manchu 25, which was a 25-mile road march uh, to earn the buckle. Um, that was lots of fun. Um, but I had no idea that the 3rd Battalion had been uh, originally had been an all-black battalion in, in, in the second division. In the summer of 1995, uh, our, our brigade, uh, which at the time consisted of the first, second, and third battalions of the 9th Infantry Regiment, our entire brigade was re-flagged uh, to become the first brigade of the 25th Infantry Division. And uh, so the three infantry battalions, uh, we all changed to different regiments. Uh, the idea was to send the 1st and the 2nd battalions of the 9th Regiment that had historically belonged to the 2nd Division back to Korea, where the division headquarters was at the time. Um, the 3rd Battalion, we were inactivated and, and has remained inactivated since then, which is sad. But the, the regiment that we were converted to, my battalion, was the 1st Battalion, 24th Infantry. One of the original, the 24th Infantry, of course, one of the original four Army all-black regular army regiments, that that was a deliberate effort to take the 3rd Battalion, 9th Infantry, which had been a historically, which had been an all-black regiment, and through this redesignation process to a more senior regiment, uh, was to make it a part of the 24th Regiment, which we called Deuce 4. Um, and when we uh, reactivated um, the 1st of the 24th uh, back in the summer of 1995, uh, we had a lot of 24th Infantry veterans uh, there, World War II in Korea. And uh, those guys were so happy to see their regiment back in the regular army. Bringing the regiment back uh, was, just, was just fantastic. And uh, uh, since, you know, unfortunately most of those guys are gone now, um, uh, Deuce 4 continues to exist. It's still a, uh, it's up in Alaska with the 1st Brigade 25th. It's, it's still part of 1st Corps. It's like the 2nd Division and 2-2, two, two. Um, so it's all still in the family.